Um, great. So the approach today is actually going to be pretty informal. Uh, we haven't, uh, you know, prepared any slide decks or anything like that. We'll be doing some live demos and just going through some some information that we think will be useful. Uh, but really, this is this is much more about the information that you want to get. So anytime, feel free to drop questions in the chat or unmute yourself and and just uh, jump in, and we're happy to to redirect and and sort of offer you the information that you want. Um, so by way of introduction, uh, my name is Ross Parker. I work at International College Hong Kong, um, where we started Gibbon uh, just over 10 years ago. Um, I uh, am really excited to, to see you all today. Uh, it's great to have uh, a growing community of users and to be seeing your names pop up uh, in, in different contexts around the forums and through email. And then to be able to see you here in person today is fantastic. Um, I'd just like to ask Sandra to introduce herself. I know many of you know her already, but Sandra, do you want to just say a couple of words? Um, yes, so I am Gibbons maintainer. Um, I am familiar with uh, Brian and Faison and Upton and Shelley in the room because I used to work at TIS and I just started this year at ICHK, but I work closely with Ross building Gibbon developing, maintaining, working on new modules and new features. And when we get into some of the new features later, I get to show off some of the stuff I've been working on in the next version too. But you'll see me around the forums and you'll see me helping out. And um, yeah, and I'll be running uh, some of the sessions today too on the reports and importing. Thanks, Thanks Sandra. Sandra. It, it's no exaggeration to say that if you notice Gibbon getting better and better and better, that's largely Sandra's influence, uh, improving the code base and, and introducing all sorts of new features. So, uh, oh, we have a Mel as well. Hi, Mel. Okay, um, so we're going to get started with um, installing Gibbon. Um, my understanding is that you're all using Gibbon already, and so you've you've presumably installed it in some capacity, but maybe someone else installed it or you use Softaculous. So perhaps you're here to learn more about the, the installation process. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen and jump over to uh, the Gibbon website here. So this is gibbonedu.org. If you browse this site, you can head to download. Um, and for most schools, most of the time, you're going to want to use the latest stable version. This has um, the newest features that have been tried and tested, as well as uh, any security updates that we've, we've issued and any vital fixes. Um, we release every roughly every six months, January 20th and June 20th. Um, and and the we we rarely release sort of incremental releases between those major releases you will see this 0 0.1 here which indicates that we did have a minor release this time we had a bug that we thought was um, important enough to resolve that we we put out a, a minor fix um, if you're interested in seeing the, the latest cutting edge state-of-the-art gibbon um, you can always download the cutting edge code uh, using this link to our github repository um, GitHub is where we, we store and manage the Gibbon code base. And if you're ever interested in seeing what is being changed, uh, how things are run or getting involved, then GitHub is the place to do that. Um, we've got some developer documentation if you ever want to take a look at that. Um, when, you, when you come to our repo, you will automatically land on the current development branch. So you'll see that this is version 22 here. And so if you wanted to test that out, you could just download it as a zip file. That's the quickest way to get started. Um, whichever way you, you choose to install, whether you use stable because you're looking for uh, a, you know, the most stable production environment for your school, or you're looking for cutting edge because you want to see what's coming down the pipeline, or you want to contribute, or you want to test it out. Either way, the installation process is much the same. Um, and so what I've done here is I've downloaded in advance um, the version 22 file you get by downloading zip and you can see that on my desktop here and when i double click on that it will extract this fo uh, folder which has all of the gibbon files in here uh, this is when i start to check my desktop to see if i've got anything embarrassing listed here as we're recording this but no i think my desktop's uh, pretty clean today so in running gibbon you're going to need some kind of server environment um, we won't get into that in too much depth today, um, but for today's demo, I'm going to be using 
uh, a locally installed server stack called MAMP, which runs on a Mac machine. Um, there's variants of this available for, for Windows and, and for uh, and any platform that you want to use, and it's a great way to test out Gibbon. Um, I'd imagine a lot of you have some variation of this running uh, locally as well as your production system. So I'm going to take the downloaded files and just drop them into the document root of my MAMP server. And when I navigate on my computer to localhost, I'll see that newly created folder there. It's not a great name. So I'm just gonna change the name there to training day. All right, when I reload this page, command R, we're gonna see training day there. All right, if I click on that, I should get redirected to the installer. Um, this is normally fairly reliable that the, the installer loads up. If you see a blank page or an error message of some kind, um, you can check your PHP logs in order to see uh, what's going on with your server. Sometimes you don't have some of the, the base requirements for Gibbon met, and so it can't even load this first screen. Once you're in this screen, what you're going to see is uh, all of the requirements for running Gibbon. And hopefully you see these green check boxes down the side. If you don't, you can start Googling around to, to find out how you enable these different extensions on uh, whatever server variant you happen to be running. Um, before I go any further, does anyone have any questions about servers, server stacks or server software? just so I don't sort of take too much for granted. Uh, uh, just a quick one. Yep. Uh, I noticed that's running uh, PHP version seven and your new version is gonna be supporting version eight. When, when are we gonna change over? Okay, so we, we normally have a minimum and maximum version for PHP support. And at the moment, the minimum is 7.0 and the maximum is 7.6. Four, seven point four. Good thing Sandra is sitting right opposite me. She can correct me when I overstep the mark. Um, for version twenty-two, the minimum, and you can see that here, the minimum is being bumped up to seven point three, and the maximum will be eight. And so this this version that that we've downloaded, this current cut of version twenty-two, does support PHP eight already. Um, and and our feeling is that that is is pretty stable and robust but there's still more testing to be done. So we might find additional areas we need to tweak before release, but by the time we release, we'll be saying, yes, it's ready for version eight. Yeah. Um, the PHP versions are quite interesting because for a lot of people, they don't really matter. You, you get your server stacks default PHP version and it's sort of, it's not the most cutting edge and it's not the oldest, it's somewhere in the middle there and most software runs on it. But from a development side, they're constantly adding new features to PHP that, that allow us to write better, cleaner, more efficient code. And then they're sloughing off some of the older features as well. So we're always trying to find that window where we can use the newer stuff and not have to support too much old stuff, but not also have a really small PHP window. So it's a bit of a balancing act that Sandra pulls off working out which versions we're gonna support. That was a proper teacher's answer to your question, Brian. I answered far more than you asked. Good value for money. Uh, any other questions about server stacks, server software? Fantastic, all right. Um, there's a range of languages available here. Uh, this is a subset of all the languages that are currently in translation. Normally when a language reaches about 75% completion on PO Editor, which is the, the collaborative uh, translation software that we use. I'll just show you that here. Normally when a language gets to 75%, we activate it and we make it available. So you'll see here a wide range of languages that Gibbon is being translated into. Um, some very complete, some still in progress. Um, if, if you have people in your teams who wish to get involved in translation, just let us know and we can add them to the teams. So we've got about 130 volunteer translators uh, who have ever been involved in Gibbon. Some have kind of fallen away, uh, but it's a nice metric for us to use as to where people are interested in Gibbon and, and what their interests are. Um, 
the default is uh, the United Kingdom. Um, that's my own uh, biases showing there. Um, but we, we try and keep the United States uh, language um, translations sort of up to date where we can, despite that, that bias. Moving on to step two, uh, with that only that one option in step one, what you're looking to do here is connect to your database. Um, for a lot of newcomers, when they land here, they're not really necessarily sure what a database is or how to connect if they don't have a lot of um, sort of web app installation background. Um, so in short, the database is where all of your given content and information is going to be stored. Um, and uh, by default, Gibbon uses MySQL. Um, it can also use uh, something called MariaDB, which is actually a fork of MySQL. I only learned recently that My is actually the name of the founder's daughter. Uh, there you go. I always thought it was like my computer, my this, my that, but no, it's the, it's the founder's daughter. Um, after MySQL got bought by Oracle, um, some of the original team left because they wanted a, a pure or more open source um, database and they founded MariaDB. Maria is the guy's second daughter. So he managed to name both versions, both forks after his, his kids, which is quite nice. Um, some people are sort of a bit fanatical about using MariaDB because it's the pure, proper, one true version of MySQL. Uh, I haven't really gotten into that debate too much. So, uh, but either way, they're, they're cross compatible. And, and if you're using one, it's essentially the same as the other for now. How long they'll stay in parallel is hard to say. Um, in, in theory, Gibbon could support any number of other databases like uh, Postgre or Oracle because behind the scenes, notice I said in theory, behind the scenes, we use something called PDO in, in PHP to connect the database and that can support a number of different databases. However, uh, the practicality of actually achieving that, there would be a significant amount of work. So uh, that's why there's no drop down here to choose different database types. Sandra's looking a little worried that I might be suggesting that we'll offer support for those one day. I'm, I'm not saying any such thing. All right, I'm gonna give my uh, database a name. If the database exists, um, it'll connect to it. Um, if it doesn't exist, it will create it. Um, if it exists and it already has a given installation, you're gonna to get tons of errors during the, the installation process. So uh, don't try and install in a, in a database that already has uh, that information. Um, what I might do is just use a database client. Um, there's tons of different clients out there. I like SQL Ace, uh, it's very nice on a Mac. Uh, if you're using Windows, uh, dBeaver seems to be quite a good option. Um, I'm going to connect here to localhost. This is the same place that my database is, is stored that I'm referring to from here um, with the same username and the same password. And, and what I want to show you here is that there is no, oh look, Brian, you're already in my list of uh, databases there. You've achieved immortality. Uh, what I wanted to show you is that there is no training day entry here, but after we run this part of the process, there's gonna be one created and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, the username is root. I'm not gonna tell you my password. And I'm going to choose to install demo data. In a production system, you wouldn't want demo data installed, but if you're just testing Gibbon out, this gives you a whole school of students and staff and parents and timetables um, to play with. And so it's, it's a nice way to, to get to know Gibbon. The demo data is, uh, is a thing that here makes this run for a while because it just takes a while to load up all of that demo data. Look. With these sessions today, um, we haven't planned to fill the whole of every session because listening to, well, I'll speak for myself, listening to Sandra is probably more interesting, but listening to me uh, babble on all day about Gibbon is probably too much for anyone. So there'll be a chunk of content, there'll be some Q and A, and then there'll probably be a bit of downtime between sessions as well, depending on how the Q and A goes. Um, great, so after that loading, uh, in which time that new database was created, 
have to refresh databases there. Uh, we can see the new training day database has been created and it's been populated with all of these given tables. Um, hopefully, if, if you ever get to looking around in the database, you see that the naming is quite logical. Um, the naming of both the, uh, the tables themselves, but also the structural elements. We've tried to keep them as sort of semantically meaningful and, and consistent as possible. Um, we don't recommend you change values directly in your database. The interface controls access to the database to make it harder to make mistakes. Um, if you want, especially in testing, you can get into the database and tweak things, but we try and do that as rarely as possible in production because you can mess things up and that can be hard to recover from. So yeah, be, be careful on the SQL side. Step three involves me setting up my initial user account um, and then providing some information about the school. There's a lot of fields here, but only the ones with stars uh, are required. What I like to do is actually click in the first field and press enter to force it to submit. Um, and then it flags in red all of the fields that I have to submit because I, I install Gibbon a lot. And a lot of the time I just want those, those basic required fields. So um, I'm just gonna fill those in. Uh, if, you, if you leave receive support checked, you get on our mailing list, which means you get given updates from time to time and you receive a welcome email from us that explains how you can get more help. Uh, I've had that email a few times before, so I'm going to disable that one. So just creating my own username and a password for my account. Obviously, you want your admin passwords to be strong. The default policy is, is pretty strong. You can tailor that in the system. Um, as this is just a demo system, I haven't gone to town with like a 25 character password, but that's what I'd normally aim to use in a production system for my admin account. The base URL and base path um, set themselves according to where you've installed Gibbon and what kind of server you're using. You can customize the name. Some schools like to give Gibbon a different name. Um, I like the name Gibbon, so I'm going to leave it as it is. And you have three choices for installation type. Um, if you uh, contribute statistics to us down here, this tells us how you're using Gibbon, which is useful. It also controls the kind of error messages you're gonna see on screen. So in a production system, you're not gonna see error messages. Uh, in testing and development, you are going to, depending on some other PHP settings. Um, and because we downloaded the cutting edge version of the software, it's going to, to check against our servers and confirm that yes, this is cutting edge and that's set for you. You can't change that at this point. You can change this down the line. If you started with cutting edge and you decided you wanted to make a server stable, you could change it, but it's not easy. Um, it takes a couple of steps on the database side. So, uh, if you ever run into that situation, ask on the forums and we'll be able to advise you there. Um, I, I would encourage you in general to, to, um, to contribute to our collection of statistics if you can. I'm not going to today because it will be a, a, a non-useful record, um, but it's nice to know who's using Gibbon. All right, I'm going to call this Gibbon Training Day and GTD for short. You can enter some uh, value added services name and key here. Um, this mainly relates to online support and um, it's a query builder license that we offer. So ask if you're interested in that. I'm just going to select country currency and time zone. One day we'll build a nicer time zone checker perhaps with a map. That would be a fun project. All right. So when I press submit, my account is created. The setup is finalized. You can start uh, looking at some uh, sort of post install server config instructions. You can start getting help and support, or you can just log right into Gibbon, which I'm going to do now. And there we go. Gibbon is installed and running with the demo data. Um, I think the one thing I'll do with this new system before we go any further is switch it over to uh, the new theme, which Sandra has been very uh, hard at work developing. Um, theming in Gibbon used to be really problematic. We've spent a lot of time over the last four years, I want to say, refactoring, rebuilding the way that Gibbon does tables and forms and a lot of other interface elements. And what that meant is after those four years, 
when it actually came time for Sandra to build a new theme, she was able to do it relatively quickly. Um, what do you say, 10 hours work, something like that. Um, do, you wanna, do you wanna say anything about the new theme whilst I just install it? Um, we are in the same room, so you'll probably not hear us talking over each other, hopefully to not create too much feedback. But um, yeah, uh, Ross, do you have, that's interesting. I'm, I am gonna- Log, Log out and back in again. That's, uh, so, so Ross happens to be uh, showing the new theme, uh, which is coming in version 22. We were just looking at some ways to refresh, um, kind of tighten up the interface. Uh, you will notice that the sidebar switches from the left to the, for, from the right to the left. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but uh, ideally this is a way to showcase not only a new theme, but also how the theming system works. So we'll be coming out with more documentation because Definitely, um, as technology progresses and other interfaces progress, there's some standards out there that people become familiar with. So Gibbon was starting to feel a little older in terms of its look and feel. So we're working on refreshing that, but also making it more available for schools to, if they want, um, make changes to the themes and develop those as well. Um, so this is a bit of a sneak preview because it won't be out till about June 20th, but um, yeah, give a shout if you have any questions. My reaction to the theme was immediately positive. I think it's a, a massive jump forward. As Sandra said, with the, the bar on the left uh, is a change, but it makes a lot of sense uh, in, in cultures where you read left to right, which is a pro predominant given user base to have the more important information on the left to make your options there and then move to the right. So uh, it, it took me all of about three hours to get used to it. Um, and yeah, I, I found it visually to be a, a, a real improvement. So. Um, yeah, thank you to Sandra for, for her amazing work on, on this side of Gibbon. Um, so that, that is really the, the full installation process in Gibbon. As you can see, uh, even with my the time I took to give the commentary, it's a fairly quick and streamlined uh, process. Up until I think version eight, Gibbon had no installer. You just kind of had to hack around behind the scenes and write your own config file and things like that. Um, that was never really going to be sustainable for a project. And I was really impressed with the WordPress installer. Um, so sometime around, I, I want to say version nine or 10, something like that, I, I started uh, taking ideas from the WordPress installer and building them into the, the Gibbon installer. Um, does anyone have any questions about installation, uh, getting up and running with, with uh, Gibbon? Can I ask a quick question? I'm not sure exactly if I've got it in the right uh, one. Um, when you're yeah, doing the language. Looks like you want to go ahead there. Uh, Brian, we're just starting to talk. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry, I should uh, put my hand up or something. Uh, oh, sorry, I had my sound down for a moment there because there was some feedback going on. So, Brian, go ahead. Um, just on the language thing, is there any. Uh, option there for the user to choose their own language like can you install more than one language so the user can uh, swap uh, to their own uh, default language yes so if a user goes to preferences up at the top um, they can choose their own personal language for any of their logins i don't have any of the other languages installed at the moment um, to do that i would go to system admin uh, manage languages and I can see the inactive languages in red you can't install those because they're still under development but the active languages I can install so if I was to install Afrikaans it will download that from the server which will take just a moment and that will now be available in preferences for me to choose um, I know my map isn't currently set up with uh, translations properly. So if I was to click on that and press submit, it would still show in English, but that's not a given issue. That's a, a server issue on my side. And then um, in addition, if, if you just wanted to log in with a different language under options on the login screen, you can choose your language as well. So it's system login. Account, uh, sorry, system language, account language, and session language are the three different levels. I have a 
question also. Glenn, you're breaking up a little bit. Do you want to maybe just try with your video off for a moment? Okay. See, sometimes that helps the, the audio quality. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I turned my panel um, real easily. Uh, can you hear me better now? I can hear you a little better. Yeah, I mean, the, you should see a stop video. Um, I think Sandra's typing this in as well, if you can't hear me. There should be a stop video button at the bottom left of the screen. Okay. Yeah. yeah, perfect. I, I got it. Um, uh, the question that I had, uh, we are in one time zone. The host for our server is in another time zone. And I think they have their uh, system clock set to Greenwich Mean Time or Universal Coordinated Time. And some of the dates and times are displayed in different ways. Um, in the United States, we typically use for the date, month first, then day, then year. And in a couple of places, it shows up correctly. In other places, it shows up with the British style. Uh, is, do you have any advice on how to solve some of that? Yeah, so the, there's two separate issues there. One is to do with the setting of the time zone on the server side. Um, and, and the other is to do with how Gibbon renders that time. That, I'm just going to mute you for a second, Glenn, because I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Um, just feel free to unmute yourself in a moment um, to respond. Um, in terms of how Gibbon renders the time, that's determined by the language. So if your system language is set to... Uh, US, you should always see it as month, day, year, whereas with British, you should always see it as day, month, year. If you're finding that inconsistent anywhere, um, if you could drop that in the forum, like on this screen, the date here is not um, converting properly to US format, then we can look at each of those cases. Uh, but on the whole, that's all handled centrally in one way. So it should be pretty consistent. But if you're finding that it's not, just let us know. And, and then on the server side, you can't change the, um, the time zone that your host uses, but you should be able to use HT docs um, as long as your, sorry, uh, HT access. So there's a file called .ht access. As long as your host allows you to use .ht access, you should be able to drop a time zone in there in order to, to recalibrate your server time for your application, your given installation. Sandra, do you think you might be able to find the, the HT access uh, directive to do that? And we can drop that in the chat for you. Does that help, Glenn? Yes, it does. That definitely helps, and, um, and I will try that. Thank you. No problem at all. Behind the scenes, Gibbon actually always stores date in the format of year dash month slash uh, day. So it doesn't matter which uh, time zone or format you use, the date and, and is always stored in that format. And then it's always converted to a human readable format according to language. All right. Uh, any other questions on, on this topic? Go for it. Um, something that might be helpful. Oh, I might have to screen share. Uh, one second. Okay. After you log in, there are some good settings to check out after your first install to get used to your system setup and kind of some of the basic configuration. The best place to go when you first log in is system admin system overview. This will give you a look at which versions you have installed, if they're up to date, 
And it'll give you those links again if you need access to the documentation, the forms, and other information. Something to note that we've added in version 21 are some additional areas to find information on your system. So one of them, and this one's been around for a while, is the system check. And I'm just going to click that. And it's just going to go through and check some additional things to make sure everything is up and running. As you'll see, because I'm running on a test system, it looks like some of my system checks have failed. So it's suggesting that maximum um, input bars is greater than uh, 5,000, and I only have 1,000. So that's definitely something you can set that often in HT Access, or you can set that directly in your PHP any file. And you'll find a lot of information if you just like Google that and that together online, you'll find instructions of how to do that. You'll see a, a one other um, check failed, and that's just my session lifetime. And that means if I want to increase my session lifetime on my system, it has to be greater than the default on um, PHP. A few other things have um, checked successfully, and it's also checking to see that the system can access and write the files. So it's good to, right after you install to double check these things, because it's some of these will show up on the installer itself, but some of them it's going to do additional checks to see that everything is ready to go on your system. Once you've done that, if you need additional information to do any debugging, we've added a server info page. And this is kind of a replication of the PHP info file, which is often used to help you with debugging. And this has a massive amount of information about all the extensions that are installed, all of the um, uh, plugins that are available to PHP. And it's got a way to check to see that you are up and running. If you need to access your log files, it'll also tell you where your log files are located and whether you have display errors turned on or off. So if, you're, if your log files are empty, it'll let you know if logging is on or off. And a lot of times, hopefully, uh, uh, definitely as the, as the maintainer and developer, we hope that you don't run into any bugs. But if you ever do need to go hunting for log files, you can find them in the location listed here. There are a few other things we've been adding in recent versions that are good to check when you first come in. So system settings has been around for a while, and this is a, a replication of a lot of those installation settings that you've seen. But then it also goes into a lot more specific settings of what your organization is called, changing the logo, the background, people who receive information about events that happen in the system, and other settings like your time zone and other stuff like that in the system. A new one that we've added in the recent version is security and privacy. Um, so the password policy is here, which Ross mentioned when we were looking at the installer. So you can tweak and configure that if you need to adjust the password. This is the session duration. We just saw um, if we want to increase how long users are prompted um, to stay logged in for. Um, and privacy settings are new in the system. So when you saw Ross first log in after his installation, there was a purple bar at the bottom there. Um, and that's new as we're as we're helping Gibbon um, get up to date with all of the various global privacy um, kind of requirements around the world. You have the option to ask for cookie consent, and you can customize what pops up on people's screens when they click consent. But you can also customize a privacy policy, which will show up as a little block on your main Gibbon page. And that just helps you keep in line with whatever regulations you might have in your area. There's a few other settings to check out, third-party settings. If you are using any Google integrations, SMS integrations, or especially your SMTP um, settings, um, if you have mail. So if, you're, if you first install Gibbon and you aren't receiving any mail, definitely check out your SMTP settings. Sometimes your server will be using a built-in send mail or a built-in mailing system, but you might need to switch over to something like SMTP, which is a little bit more powerful. Um, a lot of the other settings in here you'll see are very familiar. We've been adding and customizing a few of the ones in the new version. I won't get into that until I think later today. Oh, uh, and one more thing, there is a log file in the system as well. So uh, the system logs um, things like logins as well as failed actions in the system. So if you ever do need to find there are the PHP logs and those are PHP errors, but sometimes Gibbon will log its own internal errors um, and that will help you see, let's say a login failed here, username does not exist. You can see different um, events that have happened in the system as well. And, and I will pass it back to Ross. Fantastic, Fantastic. Thanks, thanks Sandra. Sandra. Just, Just on Gibbon screen, um, <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't call you Gibbon. On Sandra's screen at the bottom there, there was an entry for data retention, which is another new area that's in version, does it make it into version 21? 
yeah, it's in version 21 and it, it again helps to, um, it seeks to help schools comply with the changing regulations around the world in terms of data protection and data retention. So it allows you to scrub uh, er areas of the system of personal data that is older than uh, a certain length of time. All right, I think we might just attempt to have a three minute break here before the start of the next session, um, which is uh, getting started with Gibbon. We've touched on a little bit of that, but we'll get into more detail in the coming session. So that's an hour long session. Um, if you didn't want to attend that one, feel free to, to step out now. You can always join us later for some of the other sessions. Otherwise, uh, I'm just gonna mute myself for a, a couple minutes and we'll then get started with that in a moment. <laughs>